Are you able to are you able to share your screen or do you want me to make you host? Well, I probably can. I haven't tried it yet. I was okay. just doing some things in the background, but I okay. could just to make sure that we are sure, functional. sure. So um we will start at your convenience. Um we we sometimes give some parents some time to, to get in a little bit, but uh, out of respect for your time and out of respect for everybody else's time, um, I'm going to leave it up to you to determine when we start. Okay, I'm ready to start now. I don't have to wait unless you want me to. I will. Oh, no, no. This I, I'm just here to help you. This is your okay. show. You're the math expert here. I'm going to be learning from you right now. There you go. Perfect. Well, I'm, I'm ready to start whenever you all are. Parents, are you all ready? Or would you like a moment or two to get some water or something? I've been at it since 10, so my energy is still buzzing. I haven't stopped yet. <laughs> like, that's so literal. <laughs> <laughs> they like half of a sandwich, so I got some kind of energy still. Oh, no. Oh, no. But is this going to be like an hour from 6 to 7? Um, yeah, 6 to 7.30. But we could leave some time afterwards to um, ask questions um, and see if there's anything else that that might come up along with the dialogue. But um, can I ask if you could just introduce yourselves? I'm, I'm sure that all the parents already um, are familiar with your work and and helping the students. But for our recording art audience who's going to view this back later, maybe they're new to the center. If you could give a brief introduction, I'd really appreciate it. Of course. Well, um, no problem. I'll start right now. Um, good evening to everyone. Um, my name is uh, uh, Mr. Casey. I am an education specialist with the Wooten Center, and I've been working for the Wooten Center now. This is my third year. Um, I've been teaching math in general since, honestly, since I was in high school a student. But on a professional level, I've been teaching math since 2008 working for a tutoring company, then academic associates. Uh, from there, I worked for a school, a public charter, teaching math for K to five from, you know, um, about what, 2012 until 2017. And um, in between there, I also worked for an online tutoring company where I'm current uh, general manager, uh, working with students from uh, third grade until really college but really like the high school math um, i even taught at Dominguez hill a few times under the education director uh, dr Lori emman um, i've helped to teach the teachers how to pass the test called the c best because there's a math portion for that test i've helped them to pass that test where we were able to work um, as a seminar and as 101 and out of the four teachers who were trying to prepare for the test three out of that four passed the test with a score higher than they needed one didn't pass although she did show improvement but it's because she tried to test and take all three tests not like i recommend it which is only one test at a time so you don't have to worry about the time element um i've uh, learned different curriculum from the engaged new york eureka math uh, singapore math uh you know we're using out here in um, los angeles with the common core state standards my preference is singapore and i'm going to use a lot of those strategies today and um, most importantly, I'm an open book. Can anyone have a question for me? Um, I'll leave my email in the um, chat so that you all can write and you know let me know anything. I'm happy to uh, work with the Wooten Center. I'm happy to work with all of you all. And the fact that you all are here shows that you all are trying to do the best for your um, children. And I can't say anything else but compliment that and excited to keep on persevering. And I, I believe I put my email. Oh, I didn't spell my email correctly, so don't use that one. Sorry, it's been a day. Use this one instead. All right. I believe I spelled that one correctly. Yeah, we good to go. Um, I'm just going to start talking from here. Um, woo woo. Okay, no problem at all. No problem. At all. <laughs> all parents. Um, I'm gonna try to see if we can go from here. Now, I'm going to just go. All right, I really don't know fully the direction to go into as far as what the needs are and how we will feel about those needs. However, I will always encourage you all to stop me at any time because 
I will just go, you know what I mean? But I will for sure open up for questions. I value all feedback, I value all participation so that we can all grow together, not just, you know, one at a time. All right, uh, a few things that I wanna at least do um, that I was looking at as I was working with students is there certain things that we don't want to do when it comes to math. And I wanna try to make a list as far as the don't do's Normally, I start off with the positive, not the negative, but since we are the uh, adults, I guess I can start off with the don't do's because we pay attention to that a lot of the time. One of the don't do's I'm going to say is this one right here. That's new math. Let's first off debunk the statement of thinking that math has changed. Math has not changed. Math is the exact same that we have learned back when I was in school, before I was in school, and before even that. Numbers themselves does not change. The way in which we count the numbers does not change. Now, of course, we reach solutions in different methods in different ways. However, there's nothing different. A lot of times, same statements such as that's new math, statements such as this one, can do it. You definitely want to get rid of it in your vocabulary because you are, believe it or not, defeating yourself as well as other students, your actual students, when you tell them you can't do it. Because if you can't do it, how can you expect your child to be able to do it? So I recommend that can't do it. Let's get rid of it. I will even recommend this one right here. Been too long. Let's get rid of these statements if we can. If we can get rid of these statements out of our vocabulary, we have completed the first objective, which is to not defeat yourself. It's the same thing that I tell my students, that I'm gonna tell each and every one of you. Even if it's accurate, right? Even if you feel that the method that the students are doing it is different than the method that you've learned it, you use that for your advantage, not your disadvantage. Instead of saying that's new math, you can say something on the verge of, hmm, haven't tried it that way. <laughs> You know, something of that method, you know, is there, um, haven't tried it that way. So I'm going to try to put that, haven't tried it like that. So now you're provoking thought, you're provoking curiosity, you're provoking hmm, something different that we can actually suggest as opposed of taking the bold statement of saying that it's new and it's something that you never heard before. Instead of can't do it, we want to explore curiosity, right? So we don't want to tell students what we can do. We want to tell students what we can do. So maybe instead of putting can do that, we can say that's different. I can learn even. And give yourself statements that are positive type of statements that actually provoke the fact that you can learn it. I can learn it that way. There's nothing wrong with being able to learn something different or learn something new to, you know, provoke your thoughts in to see where it goes. Um, been too long. Yeah, it's been too long for all of us. You know what I mean? So um, instead of that one, how about this one? Let's become familiar together. Let the students and yourself see that this is a group effort as to re reaching the solutions as opposed to a defeat. You know what I mean? So far, how do we look? Any feedback for any parents? Any other type of statement that we can replace one of our negative red statements with? Or, or what? Somebody in the chat, Mr. Casey, said that another good one to get rid of is I wasn't good at math, because that's what students' parents say a lot. I wasn't good at math. So the person who said I wasn't good at math, do me a favor, please. What can we say to replace that? I'm gonna put the statement, I wasn't good at math, or I was never good at math, you know. I've heard multiple different type. What's something we can say instead? I found math to be very challenging, um, but I didn't give up. Come on, I found math to be challenging, but what? I never gave up. There we go. Because if you think about it, right, we're teaching our children how to become adults. So our thing is this, what type of adults we want them to be? Do we want them to be the type of adults where something is so difficult or something we're never good at for them to just quit, give up on it completely and never try again? 
math is one of those units that you're going to use throughout your entire life. So instead of something like that, I found Mount challenging, yet I never gave up. Perseverance is key. You know what I mean? So it's just something where we want to change the mentality. And then hopefully with the strategies that we provide today, we'll make things a lot easier for us. All right, any question, comments, or feedback before we continue to our um, next segment? I'll take that as a maybe. Of course, I can always come back to this because I put it on a separate little a whiteboard. So I'll come back to this as such. So one of the things I want to do first and foremost is I want to try to give certain type of tools. Because we live in this beautiful technology age called a smartphone, we have everything we need as a resource to help us with the math process. I did see that a lot of us mentioned about Algebra 1. My quick guess is because maybe our children are in either uh, seventh or eighth grade or potentially high school. So that's why you all said Algebra 1 is a high need. Now, I don't have enough time to teach you Algebra 1. I don't. I'm just being realistic. I don't have enough time to teach because it's literally 13 different chapters. And just to be honest with you all, you've never learned every single chapter in your Algebra 1 course. Every single time you have that classroom, normally what happens is the teacher skips around because they can never teach you everything that's inside that curriculum. So the system itself is something that we have to try to perfect and try to enhance. Otherwise, us as the ones who need to learn this system is never going to grow like we need to. The reason I made a reference of a smart device and a smartphone is because there are two apps that my Algebra 1 parents, and honestly, any parent should download. And I will highly recommend you download these apps. To be honest, certain students of mine, I have also recommended for them to download these same apps. The first app is called Math Way. One of my favorites, personally. I'm gonna pull that up shortly. You may have heard of it. I'm gonna to try to show you all how it looks momentarily. Here's my Math Way link. Here it is here. If you was to download the app, the app itself will look something just like this, right? And of course it says, how can I help you? And that's not a real person, that's just the app and the app just does that, okay? It's not like it's a person there that you can ask questions to. Like all apps, there's a free version and a non-free version. I use the free version. You don't have to pay for it. Don't pay for it, we don't need to. If you want to, you can, but you really don't need to. The purpose of this app is to find solutions. Soon what students are going to understand and learn is that it's not about the question, right? Or even, I'm sorry, it's not about the solution. You're going to find that they're going to start giving the students the solution, which is why they really start getting confused when they transition from elementary algebra to pre-algebra and algebra, where they'll say x plus 5 equals 10. They gave you what it equals. So it's not about the solution rather it's about the process of getting to the solution myself i found it easier as a learner that once i had the solution i could work my way up to the problem or in some cases if i know what the solution is while i'm doing the math process i will know if i'm off if i'm on or if i made a mistake somewhere in finding this out this app definitely helps you out with that so if you go to your app store type in math way and it should be one of the earlier apps that will pop up. Now, I wanted to pull this up here so that I could kind of start to give you a rough run through as to this app, right? So you have to the upper left-hand side of the screen, three lines. If you click those lines, you see all of the ranges of this app. Yes, most of the time, you only really need the algebra portion, but for my pre-calc calculus and trig students, you also have those options as well. The way in which app will work is pretty simple. You need to enter a problem. The way that you write the problem is identical to the way that the problem is on the paper. For those tricky fractions, use a parentheses, write the expression, and close the parentheses, and then it'll keep it as a fraction like you would need to. So for instance, if I was to create a question, and I'm going to try to wing a question, I didn't pull them up yet. I just got from working with a student, and I came over here. So if I was to try to create a, a question such as, let's, I don't know, I'm just going to freestyle, 2x minus 5 is equal to, I don't know, let's say 13, so we can get an actual solution here, right? So we have this question here, and we're trying to solve for x, two-step equation. Real baseline, I'm going to put this in that app 
verbatim just how it is right here. So once I go over here to my Mathway app, let me know if I'm ever moving too fast because I do have that happen. We're gonna put in the solution that we said, 2x minus five equal, and I hope I said 12. Did I say 12? Did I say something different? Come on, parents, why y'all gonna do me like that? Y'all gotta work with me too, right? You said 13. 13, I was, there you go. I was making sure someone was paying attention. I use an odd number back there, not an even number because I wanna get a, a normal solution. I appreciate you. As soon as we press a little arrow to the right hand side of the screen, that's like our enter button. Once we get the enter button, as you all notice, it says X equals nine. Now I have my solution. So now that I know what my solution is, I already know what I'm looking for. So as my student is walking through the question or as my child in your case is working through the question, you don't have to tell them what the solution is. This is something that you can keep. You don't have to necessarily tell your children about this app. This is just a resource that I'm giving you all to have. So you can have like basically like a textbook. So now we know that the solution is nine. Students, based upon how they learn information, I'm sorry, I'm going to do my um, whiteboard. Students, based upon how they learn information, sometimes certain things will happen. So let me remind us all, your child is still learning the new language or what is called math, in this case, algebra. Please be patient with them. If they make a mistake, oh, I'm gonna get back to that statement, but just, just be patient with them, okay? So here we are, a lot of things happen. Sometimes students will subtract five on both sides because that's what it shows. Sometimes when they do that, at least in this case, while they're working the question out, you can at least see, oh, okay, I see where my child is probably getting thrown off. And at least hopefully if they know their steps, and we can talk about the steps of these type of equations in a moment, you can see what they will get based upon doing the math correctly. However, because they made a mistake here, they didn't get the answer that they needed to get. We know what the answer is, nine. We can even, if we wanted to, plug in nine as a solution to work it through to see how we end up getting that. But at least by using that application, yes, I know that wasn't the right method, but at least by using that application, we was able to give ourselves something. Now, you see where I say tap the few steps? They're trying to make money. So if you tap the few steps, they're gonna to try to say, hey, here's a real version. You can take it and I'll give you the steps. I don't recommend it. There's way too many resources on, online to where you shouldn't have to really pay for too much unless it's gonna be an actual tutor. If it's not a tutor, it's really no point in paying an app to teach your child. That's not gonna help them. This bottom line is really not. It's gonna be a support, but it's not gonna help them too much. In some cases, not all, you can clip right here. Like let's say you're looking for a different kind of solution. Look at everything that popped up for you. All I did just now, is I click this where it says not the answer you was looking for. In some cases, it would think you want a solution, but you may be looking for something a little bit different in which that's where all these additional options would come in at. Now, of course, we were looking for the solve for X. However, I want to show you all the rest of this, just in case if you was curious as to know, trial and error is your best friend. Any questions so far, ladies and gentlemen, maybe children. Thumbs up if we're so far on a good page. Look at us being able to use this smart technology. Ain't that a beautiful thing? You know, almost that age where I can say back in my day, we used this and that, but y'all know I'm joking. I'm only 33. All right, cool. So we got that part with the, and that was math away. You download on your app. There's one more. Again, this is for my advanced students, my ones who are getting into this concept of graphing. There's another help that I can actually give you and it makes your life a lot easier. And then we're gonna actually do some hands-on things together. Desmos is another one of my personal favorites. Is I would recommend this if your child is in pre-algebra or higher. Um, they won't use graphing too much in pre-algebra. You will get the concept introduced. However, I will recommend it. So basically, if your child is in middle school on up, I'll recommend both of these apps for you. Desmos is a graphing calculator to the next level. It's kind of like the reason why students can use a calculator for certain tests that can like, you know, go online because this makes it like, like very um, much easier to say the least. 
what you can do here at Desmos is you can actually type in a uh, equation and it'll actually give you the graph of that equation. So if we'll say, like say write a question like for y, because when you're graphing, you're dealing with the slope of x and y. So we have something like y is equal to, and I'm using my keyboard to type in these letters and or signs. So y is equal to 2x plus 5. I don't know why that's in my head, but it is. It actually gave me what the graph would look like. Notice how the graph color is red. So now I know what graph I'm referring to. If you're doing a system of equations that gives you two different graphs, you can simply on number two, put the second graph and it'll tell you exactly where those graphs will intercept. So for the second one, I'm gonna say y is equal to, let's change it. So let's say negative x. And if you notice, they already intersected. I don't have to create any, uh, the rest of it, but I will just because I'm feeling happy negative x plus five and as you see the blue it corresponds show me blue here and this the line that's also blue and you see how they both intersect at the same point if i put my cursor at that point it tells me exactly where the points where they pass um like the previous out if you click the three arrows which is like the menu button and if you click over here you'll see all of the different options you have as the type of graphs that you can create from normal uh, slopes, which is what we did just now, to the advanced stuff such as parabolas and your different trigonometry um, cones, pretty much every type of graph you can imagine is all here. So it's definitely one of the things that I use for my students who are starting to graph, just so they can see the graph and get into grasping that concept. Any questions at all? Because I don't want to move too fast. I always want to open up the floor for questions, feedback, comments, and all that good stuff. So to use this um, tutorial, you go in with a problem that needs to be solved, right? Like if yes, you have now, are you talking about the first one that I showed us, the second one, or both of them? Um, any any problems? Are the, is yes, ma'am. Both of the apps that I gave are for the, um, what you already have the question, the equation, mm -hmm. and based on that equation, you're trying to get the answer. I or at least we're trying to see what is happening. Like. <laughs> Ms. Caldwell, I'm not sure if you had to add something. I just muted your mic because I heard the feedback. But if you do, um, you can unmute it. But anyone else besides um, there, thank you for your feedback as well. I'm going once, going twice. You guys want to see what I got, OK? So let me show you what I got, a uh, bag of tricks. Um, I appreciate you all being here again. Thank you. And again, my name is Mr. Casey. I will be the one trying to conduct this session and hopefully you all will walk away with something more than what we had. So we went over and talked about some don't do's because we don't want to defeat yourself. We went ahead and talked about some different applications that we can use to come up with solutions. Mathway and um, Miss Rebecca, if you can type in, in the chat window, Mathway, as well as Desmos, D-E-S-M-O-S. That way, everyone can at least have the apps. Just go to your app store on your smartphone, and you can just look those up. I'm using my laptop, so you also can use the website version as well. But you know, you always have your phone on you. So if you're like out and about, you know, when this whole quarantine is over or whatever, and your child is doing the homework in the car, you can still type in the app and get that solution. Um, so that was that. Um, Mr. Mr. Casey. I'm all ears. Uh, just a quick request, if maybe with regards to Algebra 1, I know you said it's a very broad topic and to go over it all um, tonight is not feasible, but is there a way that you could go over like basics, maybe um, general symbols that are used to re represent numbers and quant quantities and formula and equations? Can we touch on that a little bit? Most likely I can. Um I'm going to try to at least open up the door like around seven o'clock to where okay. anything that I haven't addressed, I will. One of the things I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to build up the foundations. And that's what I'm about to talk about right now, because one of my biggest guests is that we have uh, areas of foundationals, which is why later on we're going to have other um, issues that happen. And let me say something since I have a floor to talk to the parents. The reason why this happens so often is because our children are overwhelmed based upon the standards that we are teaching them. We are teaching our children way, way too many standards out here in, uh, in the States, in America specifically. And as a result, they never develop a firm understanding of a concept. They always have to jump ship to another concept before they really dug into the concepts that they need. Um, case in point, 
Singapore, you know, in Asia is one of the countries, of course, you could guess that their math scores are high. Um, when I had an instructor train me um, when I was working at the elementary, I asked her, I said, for like fourth and fifth grade, how many standards are there? You know, the different standards. Um, they, she told me that roughly in Singapore, there's only about seven standards that they want to focus on. Seven. And I'm talking about your operations and a few like simple things, not simple, but a few things where you have a strong concept of it. I can't reiterate to you all how many children I've had that have problems with subtraction with regrouping, or that have problems with division. So many children who hate fractions and so many adults who hate fractions the moment it comes up. And I'm talking about these children are the high scores who's in the high end math. And yet once fractions come up, they get this feeling. And that is because a lot of times things are rushed to a certain point and you know you missed that one step, you missed the whole question. So a lot of times I wanna always um, say, give your child that piece and that layer of patience to understand that they are being overwhelmed. Like I realize it as an instructor and I try to tell my superstars that all the time, hey, you guys are being over, hey, take your time. Hey, it's been a while since we learned this. But with just with the language alone that I use with them, they're way more appropriate to approach the situation then feeling defeated that they supposed to already know it or you're supposed to have your notes or you're supposed to do this and all that extra pr uh, pressure can of course increase the anxiety and you can all imagine the rest so one of the areas units wise that i want to make sure i talk about um as i'm going over here and of course any specific question maybe around the seven o'clock hour i can address those specifically and see how i would approach so you know start to answer those questions one of the things i want to say is four operations. We always got to address the four operations. Today, I'm going to really touch on subtraction with regrouping and division, um, as well as fractions. And I'm going to do it in a different way for fractions. Um, by the way, if you all have a blank sheet of paper, I will recommend some props. A blank sheet of paper, I'm going to say let's use four blank sheets of paper, OK? Now, not the ones you're writing on, the paper that you don't need. Four blank sheets of paper. Um, I would recommend a marker or a highlighter or something like that and some scissors. If you can get these three props, yes, I'm putting the scissors close to my eyes because I'm trained. If you get these three props, I think you will like what I'm going to show you when it comes to fractions and I don't think mistakes will happen again. So let me try to get a little bit faster because I will run out of time. It happens all the time with me. Four operations what I mentioned initially, okay? I'm gonna write, so it may not look the neatest, but it's okay, four operations. When it comes to the four operations, we're talking about adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing. One of the things that I can't reiterate enough um, is this, the language. If kids can add, if your child can add, I don't care if they're in first grade, second grade, cool. We have a mission accomplished that they can add. Now start using the word some instead of giving them adding questions. Now start saying to that student who can add, what is the sum of two and three? Same concept. If you wanna build it for your student, ask them, hey, what's two plus three? Oh, that's five. Okay, I'm asking the same question. I'm gonna change it a little bit. What's the sum of two and three? Get them used to the language of sum, which means add. You ask them the exact same question. It doesn't have to be harder because they're learning a new concept of the vocabulary of math. And testing happening right now, they're defeating us based upon the language from these word questions because students are maybe reading it too fast and not reading it clear enough, or it could be the definition of these terms. Some would be one of them. Your second one would be the difference. Difference is the answer to a subtraction question. So you wanna say, what's the difference of this and this? A lot of times when they hear this word difference, they start describing how are they different. So I say to them, yes, that is what difference means. But in math, difference is one of our math words. Do you remember? It's the opposite of some. Now we're using that math language and when you start doing that, it's the opposite of some. You're preparing them for algebra because now you're using the algebra language of the inverse operations. We slowly start feeding them this language over and over again and before we know it their brains take off with what it means not that you have to learn this memory remember remember it now you gotta learn this remember it that is what needs to die 
excuse my strong impression, but we need to get rid of that completely. Math is not about memory. If you try to remember all these concepts, you will not keep it. I guarantee you, because you learn too much at the same time, okay? Some difference. The next few would be product, which would be the answer to a multiplication, as well as the quotient. A lot of us don't see quotient too often. However, the quotient would be the answer to a division question. Same concepts. Once your kids are starting to multiply, I don't change them to the uh, division. No. I'll ask them, what's the product of this and this? What's the product of three and six? Just to make sure they're familiar with that. Once they say they're familiar with that, okay, then I may switch it to other units. I'm not gonna give you all what I would do because you guys aren't instructors, you guys are parents helping your, your children. So I wouldn't expect you to do multiples and factors and area models. I wouldn't expect that from a parent. You know what I mean? I'll just expect the willingness to learn the concept with your child. Oh, <laughs> and by the way, one of my secrets, and it worked miracles for me, I kid you not, and I just learned it with the past two years ago is this. A child comes to me asking to help for a math question, and I'll say to that student, I don't know how to do none of that. I'm going to need all of your help. And they look at me crazy. But I tell them that as opposed to them thinking I know all the answers. My method of my madness is we're going to learn this together, not that you're just going to be there waiting for me to tell you what to do. Because too many of my students want to just hear what you're supposed to do, not to pull it out of them. And of course, from there, we start the process of breaking it down. And before they know it, they, re they know that they know what they're talking about. And then we use that to continue our lesson. So the language of math with the four operations is something I would recommend. I'm going to move on from this to show us the difference, the subtraction element. It is something that happens too often. So let's use a question of a question. Let me know if anyone has any question at all. I'll try to make this as enthusiastic as possible. Any feedback yet? How we feel, parents? So far, so good. Real good information. I appreciate that, family. So I'm going to try to create a question that relates to regrouping, right? So I created 645, take away 289. Now, as all of us had an instructor say, oh, you have to borrow, cross out the five, make it a 15, cross out the four, make it a three. Whoa, that doesn't make sense. Yes, that doesn't, what, what, cross out the five, make it a 15, huh? Now, if they did it this order, you cross out the four, make it a three, cross out the five, and then make it a 15, okay, that's the proper way, but still, what does that mean? I don't see 645. Now I see 6,315. Right? Don't that look like 6,315? Because all you see is just a bunch of numbers. Now I'm using color to differentiate. Imagine students using pencils and who don't write big enough. That's going to be something, right? Now, of course, for my older kids, we can't really, we can, and I recommend this honestly. I do this frequently where I would write down a question such as this. And I will show them the method that I prefer. Earlier, I mentioned about a Singapore strategy. And there's a Singapore way of doing this question. And this is the method of Singapore that I hope you all understand based upon doing this one question. We create a place value chart just to make sure that the students can see the different place values of the numbers. Um, we always start off in the ones. I could write the word out. Then we have our tens place as well as our hundreds place. For my learners, I always make sure that they know what 110 and or one would look like, right? So I'll say for our ones, let's put a dot. I wrote a circle to make it big enough. So we have five ones for our top number. For our tens, I use a stick, a line, that's a 10. So we have four tens for our tens place. So we have to make sure we put our four tens, 10, 20, 30, 40. And for our 100, I need to charge my computer. For 100, we're gonna use a box. The, what I'm using, the method behind it, it comes from the base 10 blocks, where a 100 block will look like the, you know, the 100 squares all together. The 10 block is that one vertical 10 block, and the ones look like just a one in cubic. So we're gonna create the 600s. So we have our number 645. The reason why I love this so much is because it's visual and now the students can actually physically see it. So now we have 645. Now, since we're taking away 
I'm going to take away numbers from this. I'm not going to add numbers to it because we do for our addition concept. I just jumped over here because in my opinion, it's the best way to explain subtraction with regrouping. Now, I want the students to say something for me, right? So I'm going to ask them a question leading somewhere. And this is what I'm going to ask them. If I have five, if I want to be specific, I can. If I have five ones and I want to take away nine, can I do that? Then I'll literally just wait for them. I'll see what they do and I'll wait for them. I want them to say no. If I was using the physical blocks, I want them to physically see that if we only have nine ones, we cannot take away five ones. The importance of what I'm saying is them understanding the difference of place value. Because now we're kind of like doing multiple units right now, believe it or not. But they're going to encounter that no, they cannot do that. I would say perfect. And I would ask them, what are you supposed to do? The students who are familiar with this process of where they cross out a number, put a number, cross out a number, and put a number, those students, sometimes I will use this to relate to what we're doing over here. What do we do? The four is in the tens place. We crossed out four tens, four tens, and we made it into three tens. What does that mean? We did this. We took a 10 and we broke it down next door. And then I wanna ask my students, how many ones are in 110? You will be amazed at the answers you get. Now parents, do not get frustrated. If your child say six or some random number, it's okay. You may need to say, hey, we're gonna count to 10. You may need to do that and say 10. You want them to, you don't wanna tell them, but you wanna ask them the question and watch their minds explore. Because as I mentioned before, this is a new language for our students. So the moment you start saying things to them is the moment you start defeating them. Once they're defeated, good luck with bringing them back because now I have to bring them back for you. And normally I'm a, I do an okay job with doing that, right? So we, so we went ahead and regrouped that to put the 10 ones, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and write the group of five. It's my method of writing sets of five, like rows of five. You don't have to, it's not optional, but you can imagine why I do. Sometimes I will ask the student, how many ones do we see? They will count them and I want them to. Anytime they can count, we're doing what we're supposed to do because math is all about counting. You will count a total of 15 ones, which is why we put the 15 there. And the 15 is in a ones place because it's 15 ones literally there. Now we can go ahead and take away or we can cross off the nine that we were supposed to to get the answer that's left off which you will see there, we have six ones left. Now, I'm gonna ask them the same question. I will anticipate their answer. Sometimes they say four for their answer. Watch my question. How many tens do we have? Or how many tens do we have left? I'm gonna anticipate to hear four. Uh, careful, we did something at that one. Oh, we have three tens left. Okay, we wanna take away how many tens? We wanna take away eight tens. Can we do that? Wait for them to say no. If you want to challenge them, ask them why. If they say we don't have enough, congratulations. Your child is starting to understand the concept of regrouping. Because here's the thing, math gets confusing. One minute you hear teachers say, hey, when you do a number, take away another number, you can do a small number, take away a big number. And then later on, they teach your child that five minus eight is equal to negative three. So make up your mind, which one is it? Based upon a way in which we teach our children, we'll say everything. So a lot of times I want to be very, very careful. It reminds me of that saying that we heard about the uh, mother and the child when the mother, when the child was playing with the imaginary friend, the mother yelled at the child for playing with the imaginary friend. And then after yelling at the child for playing with the imaginary, imaginary friend, they sat at the dinner table and the mother said, now close your eyes, let's pray. And then the mother started praying to an invisible God. We want to be very, very careful the way in which we say certain things to our students because, you know what I mean? And you don't want to be the cause of that and at least you want to help them to recover. All right, I'm bad. That was a, that was a tangent because I do that sometimes. Now, here we are. We can't. We have three. We can't take away eight. So you ask the question, what would you do? You want them to say, we need to borrow. We need to regroup. Cool. If they don't use that language, take one next door. Cool. As long as they understand that you can't take away because you don't have enough and they understand that you borrowed from next door, you completed the objective. 
If they don't say it, we just practice again. We just practice more until they get that concept. Then you ask them the same question we asked before. In a hundred, how many tens are there in a hundred? Let them tell you the answer. Again, brace yourself. You may get eight. Then you may have to do this. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80. That's 80. Wait a minute, huh? We said 100. You may need to say 10 until you say 100. And then you say, oh, how many tens is that? What we literally see is the 10 tens. From there, of course, the process doesn't change. But at least now the students can tangibly do the math. From here, we want to take away the eight. So I'm going to go ahead and cross off the eight, five, six, seven, eight. We have that five left over. And then from there, we have the 500s. We take away those two, we get our 300s left over. 356 is that answer in a different method that hopefully will show them the method of regrouping before we just do it and not even be able to explain how we were able to do it. Any question? I'm not done yet. I just started. <laughs> As I told you, I would ask if I had any questions or anything. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. So when you're doing the, the visual hundreds, tens, and ones, yes, and you go next door, so like how you have your, your 10 and it went next door, would it be okay to actually cross that out? Like cross out that, that one can. to kind of give to, for the visual component of it? Okay. You for sure can. Um, what happens okay. when you're actually using the base 10 blocks, I recommend base 10 blocks. When you physically move it, and you break it down, you're going to take it away anyway. Right. So yeah, you were to, because you, know you know your child, you're going to do something like that to make sure that they don't see that. I don't have a problem with that at all. Okay. Excellent question. Anyone else? Because it's really all about you all. You don't have to say anything, but don't need to. I'm going to make sure there's no other question before I move on. All right, I'm going to move on to the next one. And of course, I can always come back if need be. The other concept I would say is division. Um, it's hard to go to division without multiplication. Um, when it comes to multiplication, I can give you some things. One of the things I'm going to give you all is another uh, website that's potential for children to practice their multiplication. It is something that my company used, and I gave this to the Wooten Center a few times as well. It's arithmetic games. Now, here, this is something I'm going to uh, include the link on the chat window in a moment. This is a game where it's not really a game. It's just like a way that children can practice their multiplication. Now, when it comes to multiplication, for me personally, I only recommend numbers one through nine. I only focus on the digits. You can say zero through nine if you wish, but I only focus on those 10 digits. I do not focus on 10, 11, and 12 because 10, 11, and 12 is just an extension of one, two, and, one, two, and zero. So as long as they have their digits down, they have enough what they need in order to, you know, become fluent. Um, when you ever go to this site, I'm going to include the, in the link, I say click off addition, subtraction, and division to where they only give the students multiplication questions. Now, you want to change the range because imagine kids having to go up to 100, that's not going to help them. So when I make the first one, maybe between one to nine, if you know your child and your child is struggling with the six, sevens, and eights, Take it out. Give them the six. One to six. The other one. Give them one to six. I mean, I, mean, I said one, but I put two. Give them, give them that one. Scale it down for your child. Let them get comfortable. Look at their pace. Look at how fast they go. The duration, we can change it from 30 minutes up to 600 seconds. I will never do 600 seconds. That sounds like a punishment. Now you're learning math. I'm just talking, you know. Maybe not 30. That may be too fast, but maybe 60, which is a minute, to maybe two minutes. You know, and see how they do. You can gauge your child, how well they do. And, um, you know, of course, you can always scale it. But range-wise, I say maximum up to nine. Once they have that down, trust me, you're good. Okay? I'm going to try to include this link in the window, and I'm going to give us a quick strategy that we can use when it comes to concepts of multiplication before I move over to division. I'm going to move a little bit faster, so I apologize in advance. All right, let me talk a little bit about multiplication. Um, most children say to me, hey, Mr. Casey, I don't know my timetable. And I say to them, you know what, I don't care. As long as you know your twos, your fives, and sometimes I would make reference of your tens. Sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes. I would give them this reference, right? And the reason why I use these, because 
nearly all children can count by these once they get past first to second grade. Because as an activity they learn, they learn to skill count. So we're using that strategy of skill counting and taking it to the next level. Um, just today, I had a student say, I don't know my six timetables. I told them, I don't care, we still can do it. The question at the answer was six times six. He wasn't sure what the answer is. And you know, this whole thing, six, 12, 18, 24, that whole thing, it works. Don't get me wrong, but here's the problem with that. Six, 12, uh, 17, um, um, 23. I hear that too often, where if you miscount a number, there go your memory, now you have your answer being incorrect. Now I gotta spend more time to reteach that to you in a sense, right? I say go to the fact that you already know. We're looking at six times five. So let's go to, I mean, six times six. So let's go to the known fact. The known fact would be six times five. Six times five, they can skip count quickly. Most of them will yell out 30. Cool. And then this is what I tell them next. Now, what number is repeating? They say, oh, the six repeating. Okay, so all you have to do is add six more. Wait for them, they're gonna tell me 36. Boom, they got their answer down. So as opposed to saying six, 12, 18, 24, 30, we went right to 30, then we added six more. Same thing goes for every other number you can imagine. For seven times six, seven times five, add the seven more. Same thing goes for all the rest of them. So that way they can have a, not necessarily a shortcut, but like some type of method they can use that's tangible that they can touch. Let's say if the previous one were the times two, if their quest was six times three, yeah, they can do six, 12, 18, if they can do it like that. Unfortunately, a lot of times they're rushed. So go to the six times two. Six fingers count by two, you get the 12. Now remember, the number that is repeated it's the number that you add next. So you already got your 12. Now you just add six more. Now you have that um, product of 18. Notice my language, that product is 18. That's how I slowly integrate the language to the students. Pretty soon they start speaking math to me. All right, now this is my method. Of course, the 10, you'll do the reverse. So if you had a, a question such as like, a, I don't know, like a seven times nine, you can go to, seven times 10, a lot of kids would yell out 70 off the quickness. Now, since I'm going in reverse, if I already showed them this method, I'll show them that we're going back. So we have to take the 70, and again, the number that is repeated, we're gonna take it away. So once I do the 70 and I take away seven, we're gonna get our answer 63. So just, you know, a method that gives them a little bit of a shortcut where they're not so overwhelmed with having to count from zero all the way to the multiple that they're looking for. Um, we're still good, everyone? I see that time is 6 for Yeah, someone do the activity with the paper, especially if y'all went and got pieces of paper and things. So I definitely got to show you what we're doing with the paper. All right, division concept. Uh, or parents, tell me. Do you all want to see the division concept broken down in a similar way that I did the subtraction concept, or would you like to see something about fractions? <laughs> I could have created a poll, but I forgot to ask you all. How about this? Thumbs up for division, thumbs down for fractions. No disrespect to fractions. I hope fractions are not around. Didn't mean to disrespect you. I'll try to do both, but I'm going to try to decide. Okay, um, say nothing for both. Cool, both. All right, let me try to speed through this then, just for you all. Now, for the vision concept, let's say we had a number such as, uh, I don't know, 300. Let me keep it simple before I make it advanced. Let's say 36 divided by, let's keep it simple by saying three. So a lot of the times we want students to understand the concept of tens and ones again. So in 36, we have three tens followed by six ones. I also want students to understand that the number three represents the equal groups. So right here, we have a total of three equal groups. By the three equal groups, I will create literally three different circles. And now the objective, I always remind students that division is fair. We wanna make sure that each group get the same exact number. 
That's the old method of division. We want to break down the tens, where each group has the same number of tens. We're going to break down the ones, same concept. You all can see this one, right? Where you're seeing how I can give this group 110, this group 110, this group 110. Notice my language, it stays the same consistently, right? Here's a one, here's a one, here's a one. Same thing goes for the other three, and then we see our answer in a moment. So then I ask the student, how much does each group have? Well, once they see over here, 110, two ones. What number is that? They sometimes may say three. Remember, it's our job to be patient with them. You know, be careful, is that a one or is that a 10? Oh, that's 10, 10, 11, 12. Okay, so this group has 12. What about my other two groups? To verify that each group has the same number because division is fair, each group gets the same amount. Now, I know you all ask yourself a question. What if you have a number that's not perfectly balanced such as this number? Well, you've seen it before. I'm just gonna prove it to you. If the number was something such as, let's say it was 48 divided by three. Why am I dividing by three? I don't know, I'm just picking three. So if 48 divided by three, same concept, that's the main idea. We have this time four tens, and we also have eight ones. And we're gonna divide them into three equal groups still. So then I wanna make sure I show three equal groups. I don't know if y'all notice how often I use colors, but it's all the time. I had a teacher advise me that it's important for children to see how things stand out and colors is an easy way of doing that. So I found myself doing that as many times as I can, just so they can see the difference of place values, numbers, what they represent, you know, a lot of different reasons. All right, so I have 48 divided by three. Now in this case, it's a little bit different than that previous question, right? Where, I mean, try to use blue to keep it consistent. I don't do it like that. I don't, because in my opinion, that's rushing them. I wanna make sure that they see and they take their time because this is a sensitive area that students struggle with. So we'll cross it out, put a 10 there, cross it out, put a 10 there, cross it out, put a 10 there. Then I go back to the first group and continue. In this case, we have 110 and we're trying to put it into three different groups. Can I show y'all something? Of course the answer is yes. If I have this question in the default way of 48 divided by three, and you know, the normal way of three goes into four and all that kind of stuff, right? Uh, pause, one of the things, and I'm sure you uh, parents who actually watch my tutoring sets with your child, maybe was wondering what I was talking about. If you heard me say this, dad, oh, that's too big. So I'm gonna decrease my writing size, one second. I don't know if you guys ever heard me say this before, but this is what I'm referring to. Dad, mom, sister, brother, and Rover the dog. Rover the dog makes them laugh. I don't know why, I think it's funny. Rover the dog. This, believe it or not, is a family steps of division. And I will actually explain it to the students. Here's an easy way of remembering the steps for division. You don't have to write out the entire um, family. You could just put the letters D, M, S, B, R. Soon what's gonna happen is this. You're gonna write the symbols where first you divide, then you multiply, then you subtract. After you subtract, you have to bring down. And for the R for Rover, it will be repeat. Sometimes it'll be a remainder. Depends on your child's age, to be honest with you. Once they have fourth and fifth grade, they stop seeing remainders, they start seeing decimals and fractions, you know. But I can still put it that way. Let's follow that for a moment because I want to get to the point where I have to bring down so I can explain that a little bit. Three goes into four one time. You guys guessed it. This one is the same one that is these different numbers. Now, careful. This is not the number one. This is what? Come on, parents. What is this? Come on, parents. What is this? 10. 10. There we go. This is actually 110. And notice what place I'm in. I'm in the 10's place. So that one is representing that same 110 that each group has. That's a division concept. Then we go to multiply, where we do three times one to get the product three. There goes that language again. Now I want to find the difference. Yes, I do the exact same language with the students to teach them the language of math. I would recommend that. Now we want to do sister, subtract. 
find the difference. The difference of four and three will make one. Pause. This one or 110 is the exact same as that 110 that is left over. The moment that we actually bring down the eight, we create a number such as 18. Really, it's 18 ones, because at this step, we will have to break this one down. So we'll take this one and break it down into, you guessed it, 10 ones. And if you were to count that total, you would count a total of 18, just like the 18 we see here. At that point, we will just repeat our steps. So we go right back to divide, which we have 18 divided by three. Now, I believe that we'll have it from there. I don't wanna make that assumption. Do you guys want me to continue? Thumbs up if yes or thumbs down, I mean, thumbs up if yes, or I can move on to the next one. Do y'all want me to continue from here or do you all see it? Yeah, okay, no problem. Just wanna make sure. So at that point where we bring down the eight, or in this case, I'll go back to the picture. I rarely will show this if they're just learning division. If they're just learning division, we would do this concept over and over again. I had second graders and first graders at the center that I would do this concept with, with using the blocks. And now those first and second graders are two grade levels above their math. I know exactly what I'm talking about and I will highly recommend this on um, my parents, okay? So now I'm gonna do the same concept where we're just crossing out, put it in there, each one at a time. Let them see how easy the division concept can be because it doesn't have to be as complicated as we make it out to be. Not us, the parents, not us, the learners, but us as the us that we're talking about, all right? And I'm just literally moving each dot at a time because anytime that math strays away from counting, congratulations, it's not math anymore. I don't know what it is, but math should always be a counting concept. Now notice how I was doing one at a time Look, I just stopped. There's three left. There's three groups left. Each group has five. So if I'm doing it with my student or my child and I notice that this one has four, this one has five, this one has something else, then I want to maybe stop them, maybe say, hey, hey, I think you're moving too fast, just so they can check that because, you know, a lot of things happen. Nonetheless, we will see that each group will have how many ones. Once we get to that point, I ask them how many, group, how many ones are in each group. Hopefully at that point, they will only count the blue dots, which is why colors are such an important thing because then you differentiate place values by just writing the different colors. All right, so of course we'll see that we have six ones for each of these groups. Um, if I follow the family of division, right? Mom is next, which is multiplying. Six times three, we get the answer 18. The difference of those two makes zero. Or I could have just asked the students, how many are in each group? 110, six ones. If you want to be fancy, look, 10 and six. That looks like expanded form, doesn't it? Too bad that went away. But of course, that creates the 16. Every group has the same number. All right. How are we looking so far? Any questions, comments, concerns, or anything like that? Because I think we want to get to cutting up paper. Yeah, we good to go? Cool. Oh, see, I appreciate that. That paper and those props that you got. Did you all do this? Actually, you got to get like some sheets of paper. Now, it's important for the paper to be the same for each. So that's why I got some blank sheet of paper for me. Because this concept we're about to talk about is fraction. Now, this would be the four operations of fraction that you can do. And I'm talking about fractions without the same denominator. So it's like a very important uh, lesson, which is why it's so important for me. So um, I'm gonna try to do it. Mine is not gonna be as neat as it normally is because I'm gonna like, like, you know, try to rush for the sake of time. I'm, you know, of course I'm, I take my time with the children. So I get that one whole sheet of paper. Now we're talking about fractions. We did this one whole sheet of paper. What did I just say? I said one whole sheet of paper, right? Guess I'm gonna write on this paper. You guessed it, one whole. Why? Because this is one whole sheet of paper. Well, we got that first sheet of paper and we wrote in there one whole, excellent job. We wanna set that to the side and we wanna get our next blank sheet of paper. Okay, 
Now, <laughs> I'm silly, by the way, um, and I work with children like primarily, so I have very, very funny ways of saying things. So we're gonna fold this like the hamburger. Not like the hot dog, not like the hot dog, okay? Not the hot dog, but we're gonna fold it like the hamburger, okay? Now, the better precise this is, the better. So I'm gonna try to fold it. Of course, you all can do this later when you take it more time. I'm gonna fold it just in half. Yes, I'm gonna fold it in half. It's the reason why I'm using that language. You can imagine why. All right, so I folded this sheet of paper like a hamburger. If you want a good fold, like I tell my students to do, I'll tell them to open it and I'll tell them to fold it in reverse. That's like the best fold you can really give yourself where you know it's as even as possible. All right, sometimes when I'm doing it with my kiddos, I will even try to make a line there. I made a line right on the fold itself. So you actually can see our two different sections, right? I folded this paper in half. I said that so many times because I'm gonna write a fraction on that paper. One over two goes on one of the pieces and the other piece is the same fraction, which would be one over two. Talk to me, food concept, I can give it to you. Oh, food concept, now you to make me hungry. Now we put one over two. I thought that, that, that was me. All right, so we got our two halves right here, right? Now, with your scissors, you can go ahead and cut this down the middle. Um, if your child is with you right now, give them the scissors, let them cut. They are being, uh, you know, supervised by the parents, so they should be okay. Meanwhile, I'm gonna go to the next one. Now, just like the previous fold, we're gonna fold it the same way as it start. We're gonna first fold it like the hamburger. And we'll just fold it, I guess you could say, what, horizontally? If you look at it the same, I'm sorry, vertically. That's bad when I say the wrong word. So we just folded it vertically, just folded it up from down. And we're gonna fold this piece in half as well. So we're gonna fold the half in half. Yes, I just said that. We folded the half in half. I wonder what did that create? I just gotta talk mouth, right? So we should have a piece of paper that looks just like this. Once I open it up, if you want, you can refold it and it'll make the perfect folds. But if you look at it, you should have four different pieces. Now, every single one of these is gonna have the fraction one over four. Just like how every one of these have the fraction one over two, every single one of these is gonna be one over four, okay? So I'm just gonna to try to quickly write that. And I wrote it as such. I didn't write the line because I'm kind of respect the time in case you have specific questions for me. Love, I have to do, I'm sorry, have to. Last but not least, I'm gonna try to do one more and then you're gonna love these concepts, okay? We're gonna fold it like the hamburger. You gotta love the kids in elementary. I'm telling you, they come up with the craziest ways of saying things and it always makes me smile. So we fold like the hamburger. Then we'll fold it like the hot dog, right? <laughs> okay, so we got that paper like the force. Now I'm gonna fold the fourth in half. So I'm basically gonna multiply the fourth times a half. And that's not the math we're gonna do, but it's kind of similar to that. So a fourth, we just folded that in half and we're gonna create a certain amount of pieces. Those ones who say, hey, you're right, that did create one eighth. We should have created ace. Now don't do what Mr. Casey did where I did 16ths and 32s <laughs> because it's a lot of pieces of paper. However, for you all to see what we're gonna do next, this would be the one we're gonna stop on. And each of these will be one over eight. So just label each of these the same fraction, one over eight. And in a moment, you'll see the concept. So we should have four papers, as I mentioned before. Um, the first one should be one whole. The next one should be one halves. Our next one should be our fourths. And our final one should be our eighths. Okay, so I'm gonna try to cut that out and I'm gonna try to move quickly. Um, I guess as I'm cutting, anyone wants to say anything at all? I'll try to move faster than I need to. Mr. Casey is a math hey. whisperer. <laughs> say it again? You are a math whisperer. Oh my gosh, I, this is amazing. I didn't do anything, what do I do? You should see me when I'm really warmed up. My daughter is always laughing when she's in your class, which is not often, but she's, in, <laughs> she's laughing and learning. What can, we can't ask her anything more. 
<laughs> What's your daughter name? Who's your daughter? Maddie. Maddie Williams. Oh, Maddie. Okay, okay. That's always awesome. Yes. She's, she's a bundle of joy. I remember Miss Sarah told me some great things about her. Yes, thank you. Yeah. How's her cousin doing? I think her cousin came to the summer program last year. He did. He's doing good. He is uh, using his video games to <laughs> pass his time away. So hopefully we'll get him in here too. That's absolutely correct. Um, um, absolutely correct. All right. Everyone, I'm on my ace right now that I'm cutting out. And like, this is not just something to do as a busy activity. This is really and truly a concept. If you notice how much I'm smiling, I'm smiling so much not because I'm doing what I love, but also because if I can take a concept that's complicated like fractions and then make it as simple as a second grader can understand it, it makes me feel like I did what I was supposed to do. And one of my second graders actually retaught me this concept. And you can imagine how much joy they gave me. So I have my different, I'm trying to change my camera to where you can see certain things, right? So I have all of my different pieces. I have my eighths there. I have my fourths there, should be four of those. I have my halves there. Now I didn't cut them out perfectly, but they're good enough to see this concept. All right. Now let's get to my whiteboard. What can we do with these sheets of paper? We ask really good questions. Um, now, it's not going to look as neat because I'm not using my, my tablet right now. I'm just going to write with my finger. My first question would be one hole is equal to what? Let's talk about equivalents, right? Because before you go into operation with fraction, you got to make sure you understand their equivalents. So I have one whole sheet of paper. I could say one whole is equal to, if I take these halves and I put two halves, it covers the whole sheet of paper. So I technically can say that one whole is equal to two over two. Because I use two halves, right? What else can I say? What else can I say? I can say that one whole using the same whole is equal to two over two. What else is equal to? What about these fourths? Then I start asking my learners, how many of these fourths would it take? So I'm trying to angle and position my camera where I can kind of sort of see what I'm doing. And I'm going to put the force on top of it as such. And as soon as I do that, as you all can notice, four out of four, I think y'all can see, right? No, 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 right about there. There you go. Four out of four will be equal to that one whole. So then from there, we even can literally put that is also equal to four out of four. And soon what happens with the students is they start jumping and saying, oh, also eight out of eight. Most of the time, I don't even have to tell them, you know? But let's use an actual fraction. What if we said one half? One half is equal to what? So now, we want to take only this half of a piece of paper. And we want to go to the piece that's smaller than half. Now, i got to put it this way to make sure it can fit. And I can put another piece right here. And when I put the pieces, it covers that whole one half. Mm -hmm. So then I say one half is equal to how many fourths? Now my students can tell me two fourths is equal to one half. Mm -hmm. They can literally physically see the equivalent fractions. And then from there, they can start getting into that concept of how those fractions are equal. Of course, let me use a different one. I have those little bitty pieces. How many of these eights is equal to one half? I'm gonna lay it down because the eights are many, like in both instances of the word. So my eights down. Four eights. Oh, who said that? Me. <laughs> I appreciate whoever me is. I'm going to put four eights right here. But notice how you can physically see the fractions. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. We did equivalent fraction. That's all. You got more? Yes, I got a little bit more. What if we start to get into the concept of adding them? Now, I'm going to do a fraction, one half, plus one half. Uh, okay, fine. One half, one fourth plus one fourth. This helps the concept where I could use the previous one too. I'm going to write it real fast. One half plus one half. This kind of helps the students who like to add the denominator. It kind of like gives you the reason why, right? When you do the first one, let's do one fourth plus one fourth. About one fourth. And I now have another one fourth. Now I have what? For them to say your answer will be two out of eight, 
-hmm. is very rare because where would you even see the number eight from? Of course, four plus four is eight, but you don't even see it. So now if I have a smaller student who's learning this concept, they won't even say such a thing because all they see is a fourth and a fourth. Then I ask them, yeah. how many fourths do you have? I'm giving them the language that I want them to give me. Then they say, we have two of those fourths, which mm -hmm. is, of course, the correct answer we should have saw. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, you guys aren't convinced as much because I have a tough crowd sometimes. I understand, I understand, I understand. So let's give it something like this. Let's give it a different one, half, one fourth plus one half. Let's mix it up. What are we gonna do in this case? We have a fourth and a half, all right. So now I have my one fourth and I have my one half and I wanna add these together. I want children to see how these papers look kind of like, it's weird, how do I add this together? Like what, what, what's gonna be my total? You know, like I really can't, they look two different pieces. Because we built them up with the equivalent fractions, I would say to them then, hmm, I wish it was a way that they, they were the same size then I'll let them think a little bit. Then I'll say, hmm, is there a way we can break down this one fourth? Then they'll go say, mm, maybe. So I'm gonna use a one fourth and I'll even, I'm just asking the questions. I wonder how many fourths would they have equal? And I want them to simply say, I'm sorry, that didn't really work on my camera, so I'm gonna do it this way. I want them to say, oh, look, two of my fourths would equal to that one half. Okay, so two fourths, plus one more fourth will give you a total of how many fourths? Kind of see it a little bit, maybe? Three maybe fourths. Bit. So three and you can literally see how you have the three fourths. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to worry about the whole multiplication that one half got to multiply the number in the denominator times two, one times two is two, two times two is four, one, half, one fourth is the same, and then I'm getting that answer, right? Mm -hmm. But you see how that concept, they were able to see it by just using some sheets of paper. Hmm. Later on, when they get into the concept of having to make an equivalent fraction, imagine how much easier it would be for them to be able to do such a thing. Now, I'm going to do one more before I have to make that transition to open up for questions and answers. Because I mean, honestly, I didn't talk about everything I wanted to talk about. I want to talk about some SATs. I want to talk about integers. Pam does love exponents. I had a list, but it got good. So let's say we had one half, and this time we're going to take away one fourth. So again, I start off with the bigger number, what it said, which was just a one half. And I already have the fraction written on there, one half. Now, I tell them how you want to take away a fourth. You want to take this away. I'm like, what, do I have to rip the paper? No, we want to keep this one half. I wish there was a way that we could break this one half down where we had nothing but fourths. Mm -hmm. Now get quiet and wait for them to see what they do. Hopefully, they start to see this concept of how the one half is equal to two out of fourths. So now I have these two fourths. I'm going to put them side by each. And once I take away a fourth, all we have left is one fourth. So they find themselves being able to get into the concept of fractions and even look at them with regrouping, I'm not regrouping, with the unlike denominators in a different kind of style where it seems like it's, you know, right to the point. How you all feel about that? I, I know I didn't do multiplication of fractions. I can if you guys want to see that, but I wanted to open up for an open forum for my parents because you are the reason why I'm here. Hi, I have a question. Do you have an app for pre-calculus? Um, now, the one that I shared with you, the one for Mathway or even for Desmos, both of those have their pre-calculus um, options. So if you were to actually um, open up that and you will see pre-calculus uh, pre as one of the options. Let me go to it um, with you right now. So I'm well, to... I'm on the phone, so I can't see you, but <laughs> thank you. Oh, if you oh. want to show the other parents, but uh, okay. thank you. Oh, of course, of course. Um, oh, so, you, so you can't even see my screen right now, huh? No, I'm, I called in. 
Oh no, I understand completely. Um, maybe if we can um, even send it to you, I oh you called in so you don't have my email. Um, if whoever you got the information from, they have a way of getting in contact with the Wound Center directly. Just make their um, go and just you know email all of us, and for sure I can um, email you back the uh, locations. Okay, thank you. That's what I'm hearing. Anyone else by any chance? Um, I'm not that explosive. This is very recorded, right? Yes, I believe it's very recorded. Yes, it is. Um, yes, I um I just wanted to say I teach middle school. Yes, ma'am. So a lot of the things you're teaching, if the elementary school children would could come with it, we could because like you said, I agree with Build it. Um, the, the amount steps. of standards that yes. we're required to cover. And so when they come to middle school and we're Required to cover them, Absolutely. we can no way go back mm. and don't have time. do what you're doing. And I'm seeing everything you're doing; it, it like it works. Yes, ma'am. Um, 100. I, I would say this if I can make a suggestion. If there's any middle school parents, sixth or seventh grade, yes, you please, you please. were saying you didn't get to integers, um, but that's like a major major thing before they go to algebra so if, if the parents if you have a kid sixth seventh grade you know please kind of stress integers over the summer maybe start because that's where we run into as middle school teachers a lot so let me say something real fast because it came up and i feel like i had to touch on integers because at least touch on pre-algebra and enter integers is one of the beginning concepts when it comes to integers the trickiest will be adding and subtracting right so what I like to make sure I tell or compare my students to help them to see it is to think of money. When it comes to integers, to think of money. Once I can think of the concept of money related to integers, it'll start making a little bit more sense, right? Let me try to create a couple of questions that are, and that's not a negative sign, that are integer based. All right, I wrote on the question and I'm sorry I wrote it too small. I'm gonna try to enlarge it for everyone because I know we may be on different devices. Um, for this one, I put negative five plus six. I will read this question as this. You owe $5, but you have $6 in your pocket. Do you still owe money or do you now have money? <laughs> Could you not? Just like that. You owe $5 because a negative is like you owe money. So you owe $5. However, you have $6 in your pocket. Do you still owe money or now do you have money? You yeah. normally say, um, I have money. Okay, how much money do you have? And then from there, I have a dollar. From there, we have it equals to the one. So let's go into another concept, right? Same type of philosophy. We're going to change it a little bit. Let's say if this was six minus eight in this case, right? Now, same kind of question. I could say you want to buy something that costs six dollars. Well, I'm sorry. Let me change that a little bit. I apologize. You have $6, but you want to buy something that costs $8. Mm -hmm. I always want to associate with the integer or the negative part as you happen to owe money or want to buy something, something that suggests is taken away, all right? So you have $6, but you want to buy something that costs $8. Do you have enough money or do you still need money? Need money. And they see that you still need money. Hopefully with that, they start to provoke that thought of you needing something. So you still need, per se, how many dollars? You still need two more. Mm. You know, so I try, so sometimes I, I wish I can create something that I'm, there's a lot, let me see. For this one, negative six minus seven. Um, now, to be honest with you all, if I'm teaching this to a student for the first time, I use the same digits. I don't change around the digits because I want them to grasp the concept and see how the same number is changing based upon our signs. So I would use five and six over and over again if those were the two digits I decided. I'm just doing something a little different with you all. So for my third one I have, you owe six dollars, but you borrow seven more dollars. Do you now have money or do you still owe even more money? You owe even more. You owe even more. Off top, you said, I owe more. So I owe, that's my negative sign. 
But the concept of saying more is me having to add the numbers together to get the total of the $13 mm -hmm. that I now owe. But we're literally making them that much more aware they're using that concept to develop their um, integer knowledge. And of course, you can never go wrong with a number line. So this is for the non-visual and notice that we only use a couple of the, um, the different learning styles. I use auditory and I use um, just writing numbers. You know, I, I keep in mind that students have different learning styles and we wanna always keep that in mind with them. Some students are visual and some students are hands-on where they may need to physically have money and take it away so they can actually physically feel what integers are. Um, I was gonna say a number line, where if I was to do a number line such as this, I'm saying that this point would be zero. It's a way that, that teachers try to instruct it by choosing zero. And of course, numbers less than zero or behind zero are our negatives. Numbers that are greater than zero are our positives. So in any of these questions, we can start off like around there. Since I'm gonna write, let me try to get my tablet. That way it can look at least neater for everyone. So if I go back to the first question that I had, let's say if the own money concept you guys don't like or you don't wanna teach your children debt, I understand that, use a business concept. But in this case, we have negative five. So we had zero, negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, negative five. I wouldn't have used blue. If you all kind of, kind of, kind of get my drift, I'll use a different color just so it can stand out a little bit. You know what I mean? So we have that negative five being there because that's the first number. Now we're adding six, we're adding. So we got to remember that when we add, numbers should go this way because numbers are becoming greater. From them seeing this, they'll start to see and compare that negative five is actually smaller than negative four, which is actually smaller than negative three because they're becoming greater when they go towards the left. We want to add six. So all we have to do is just go using green, that orange. One, two, three, four, five. And you guessed that I would have to create one more after zero, which would be the number one, six. That would be my solution. And notice how the one already is positive. So of course, if you were to, let's say, do like a lesson time with your child, do a lesson time with your child. Already have your number line set up with the range that you're going to do, no matter what the range is. It really doesn't matter. The practice is the most important part. So you can set up your numbers however way you want to. If you want to give them some trick questions, like let's say they got it, but you want to make sure, do this then, where you skip every other number. Because I can imagine how these test questions look and want to kind of mimic that. And, you know, you just play around with this and let them see the concept for themselves. Um, for the previous one where it says six minus eight. In this case, I start with my first number, which is six. Now, remember, when we add, numbers get bigger to go to the right. So the opposite must be when we subtract. So when we subtract, numbers must get smaller. We must go to the other side. So since we're taking away um, eight, we're gonna just start off at six and we're just gonna count down eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then I'll ask, what is this number? You know, like maybe I'll put a question mark or something like, what is this number? If this is zero and this is one and this is zero, what is this number? Oh, negative one, negative two. And you all will see how they'll get the solution for negative two. But notice how I did not stray away from counting which is the base of all numbers anyway. The concept of multiplication and division when it deals with integers, completely different type of language. So I remember uh, someone in my math camp that I went to one time, they told me about this one. Now I'm, gonna, I'm gonna write it down, but I'll verbalize it too. It says same sign, uh, positive, different sign, Negative. That's all. And this is for multipl multiplication and division of integers. So I'm going to make sure I put here multiplying or dividing. If it's the same sign, it's positive. If it's different signs, it's negative. For instance, positive six times positive five, you get the answer positive 30. Mm -hmm. Negative six, same sign. 
times negative five, notice how both of them are negative, you're gonna get positive 30. So the same sign, you're gonna get a positive result. Different sign also matters. So positive six times negative five, now notice how the signs are different. One is positive, one is negative. Your result will be negative. Mm -hmm. And the same thing goes for the latter one. Negative six times five equals negative 30. Now, as far as all that tricky stuff with the negative, negative that, leave it to us to teach it to them, okay? Don't worry about that, <laughs> all right? Because it gets tricky for sure. Like, you guys are not tripping as far as that. We got them as far as that one, you know, because we use different variety of ways of explaining this concept. So I would prefer if they can just practice about knowing this and remembering these concepts familiar to money or a number line, I think for integers, they should be okay. All right. Any, any, anything else? Because I know we got five minutes. I maybe can squeeze out something. You are any bringing back memories. I don't know which one. But that's any good. suggestions? I have a fifth grader. Any suggestions? It might be too late to do an example, but to prepare her for her fractions and decimals that she's going to be dealing with going into the fifth grade. Going into the fifth grade? Yes. Mm. Any suggestions like to help her prep for that for for that? Did you see what we did regarding the paper? Yes. That you, you're going to be doing adding and subtracting fractions with unlike denominators. I stopped once I got to that eight. So if she got that concept kind of like down understanding it, just fold the eight in half, like the the one eighth, like when it's like that one whole sheet of paper that you folded uh, four times. If you fold this in half. You would then create a sixteenth, one sixteenth. Is that right? Yeah, you create a one sixteenth, and that'd be enough. That way, you can explore adding, subtracting, and then later on, again, my email. I'm gonna write it one more time. Just later on, just email me, and I can always further explain how I would do the multiplication and division. As far as the uh, fraction and decimals as a whole, um, I didn't really do too much decimals. When it comes to decimals, uh, again, I relate it to money like almost all the time. And I would think that it's always best to add it that way. Uh, normally, if I can share this with you real briefly, I'll use a number line, not a number line, but decimal place value chart to kind of like explain that concept, how it builds up. I started to do this earlier, but I didn't. If you all remember and recall, I did this in the beginning when it came to the place value of the um, hundred tens and ones. This is what we do once they get like a little bit older, where we remind them about the whole numbers, which is the beginning would be your ones, tens, and hundreds. Then we introduce this concept known as a decimal, which is a point. And then once we get to that decimal point, we get to numbers behind a decimal point, which is now referring to part of a whole. So now the moment that I get here, if I say I'm thinking of money, I think about my dimes, like 10 cents, 10th, right? 10 cents, 10th, that's for sure should be a mirror or echo. And like um, the other instructor said, notice I'm using the concept of money because it relates to them very, very fast and easy. So, and also for the other one behind a 10th, you have your hundredth, think about a penny. How many hundredth equals a dollar? The dollar is your whole. This is your dimes. This is your penny. So you end up getting into that concept then. Um, I refer to the first side in front of the decimal as your whole numbers, $1, $2, all your bills. And I look at the decimal part as your part of a whole, which is your change. I start them off around here and they just explore this, you know, over and over again. But to be honest with them, they should be great especially if they start making sure their other concepts are solid. If your student who's going to fifth grade has no problem when it comes to subtraction with regrouping, division, which are the two units that I would cover in the beginning, and if they're solid with understanding that, and with this, without a deal with the fractions, just with the um, whole number, your halves and your fourths, honestly, they're even, even better prepared, I would want to say. But there's, there's a lot that I can give you. So um, I'll make sure you all have my, my email. Any questions specific you all have, I can you know, definitely try to find time to answer them. Thank you, Mr. Casey. That's why I'm here.
Thank you so much, Mr. Casey. Um, and thank you all to who were able to join us this evening. If you can, please, uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna send out uh, the resources that Mr. Casey has shared with us tonight, the three different websites. Um, if you could put your email in the chat box so I could have that. And just, just to go back, we will upload this recording onto our YouTube page. And when I send out the email, I'll, I'll include a link to to the video so you could quickly access it um, that way. Uh, to the parent that uh, phoned in and logged in through their telephone, if you wanna reach out to us, like Mr. Casey said, then we could share those resources with you as well, separately, because he gave us so many great websites and different different techniques. I don't want you to miss out on that. Um, so please please reach out to, to admin at wootencenter.com for, um, for those resources. Thank you. Now, if I could uh, hopefully end with two ending points, I want to say the last things that I, I want to at least mention. If you can say this to your students, it'd be amazing. The first one I have is to encourage mistakes. Encourage your students to make mistakes. Tell them you will make mistakes during the math process because it shows that you are trying to get the correct solution and it shows that you're trying to get it. So if they did a question and they got in it correct, that's what I'm talking about. You try, yeah. And they made a little mistake here. Let's find what that mistake would be. And then from there, hopefully it doesn't defeat them, but it encourages them to keep on trying over and over again. Um, last but not least is this one. This is one of my favorite statements I got from my instructor. Time does not equal intelligence. So just because your child can't yell out these multiplication facts as quick as that other person, doesn't mean they're any less intelligent than the next student. Time does not dictate your intelligence. And it's, in my opinion, it's very important for students to understand this because a lot of the tests that they have is time-based. 